it's me, Sam B. Did you know that women are people crazy, right? So why are men who wouldn't recognize a uterus if they lived in one for nine months making laws that affect women's bodies? Great question! We set out to answer this and other hard questions by compiling our best pieces on women's health. Enjoy. Terrible restrictive abortion laws are being passed across the South faster than Lil Nas X can release remixes of Old Town Road. Which, by the way, Lil Nas X, I am available if you need someone. Oh, you don't need someone? Oh, you don't need me? I'm lower on the list than Chewbacca Mom? Understood. <laughs> And while we hear a lot about the shitty men who pass these laws despite not knowing where a vagina is, we never hear enough about the women who are doing so much to fight back. So Naomi Ekparrigan and I went to the South to talk to them. When I think of the South, I imagine delicious barbecue, losing your virginity to Matthew McConaughey in the back of a pickup truck, and the underappreciated abortion activists who are thriving across the region. Today on Sticky Fingers, Sticky Conversations, we're going to dive into two of those things. Naomi at Paragon and I traveled to two cities to talk with people who are at the front lines of reproductive health. Hope you brought your appetite, because first up, Naomi goes to Daddy D's Barbecue in Atlanta, Georgia. Hey, y'all. To meet Loretta Ross, one of the women who cooked up a framework we should all probably know, but probably don't. How would you break down this concept of reproductive justice? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had unprotected sex with a man? Absolutely not. My <laughs> mama watched this show. Just say yes. Yes. No, mom. Have you ever had your period be late? This is a very bad BuzzFeed quiz. What would happen next in your life? First, I faint. I then proceed to order a whole blueberry pie, thinking in some way I can push the baby down with enough pie. I then say, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. That's where reproductive justice picks up. When a person misses her period, she has these oh my God moments, you know, that are about whether she has health care, whether she can keep a job, whether or not she can stay in school, whether or not she's going to experience violence. If you have good answers to these questions, you may turn an unplanned pregnancy into a wanted child. But if you have bad answers, then even a planned pregnancy or a wanted pregnancy may end in an abortion. I'm gonna drop this rib like I'm dropping a mic, even though <laughs> you're the one who said it. <laughs> boom. <laughs> Barbecue, boom. Reproductive justice links reproductive rights with the social, political, and economic inequalities that affect a person's access to reproductive care. But that's not a good hashtag. People are tired of the pro-choice, pro-life binary. So that's why we splice together reproductive rights with concepts of social justice to create the phrase reproductive justice. So what do you think about President Trump? Well, Trump is like the gift that keeps on giving. He keeps waking up a portion of white America that had been asleep on reproductive injustice for a long, long time. Okay, but if he's a gift, can I give it back? <laughs> can I get a gift receipt? Some. Well, well, they'll give you that when they give you your return ticket to Africa. <laughs> this uptick in interest has resulted in increased fundraising for places like Choices, an abortion clinic in Tennessee that is one of the most forward-thinking in the country. To learn more, I went to the world-famous barbecue shop, home of Memphis-style barbecue spaghetti. Mmm! to talk with the brains behind choices. Reproductive justice has confirmed a lot of things for me, that it is not just about abortion. There is a whole system that is designed to enforce their views on how women, mostly women, lead right. their reproductive life. So what we're doing here is we're operationalizing reproductive justice. That sounds like you're making it easier for people to get access to proper reproductive care. We'll provide abortion. We'll provide uh, STI testing and treatment. We see people who are HIV positive. We see transgender people. We see women who want to have their babies with midwives. So basically every single thing that gives Republicans heartburn. Yes. Operationalizing reproductive justice means returning abortion to an integrated part of health care. We're talking a full menu. Mm, I love sides. And as a bonus, it's good for business. What we saw in Texas was they passed a law designed to make 
abortion harder to provide. Then while fighting that law in the courts, clinics just start going out of business. And more clinics close and don't reopen than close and do. Like if you think about it, an abortion clinic is a business in that it's an operation that requires a lease and employees have to get paid. So when litigation causes it to shut down. People have to find another job. They have to go somewhere else so they can pay their bills because you're not bringing any revenue in. And that is why you have to diversify your business. Yes, exactly. Yes. Just don't tell the Trump administration okay. that you use the word diversify. Okay. This is genius. Who knew diversifying revenue streams by providing menopausal management and pap smears could maybe be the answer to trap laws? Do you think that if people were a tenth as excited about progressive activists in the South as they are about barbecue, the mm. world would be just generally a better place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The South has definitely been on the cutting edge of majority of the social and historical civil rights issues that we have seen. I mean, civil rights movement was started here in the South. And I think that this whole reproductive health issue is going to really be measured by what we do here in the South as well. You're giving me a dangerous amount of hope in my heart. It what is, is this that I'm feeling? It feels like joy between this and the spaghetti for breakfast. Right. <laughs> I don't know what's happening in my tummy. This is the future, and it's starting in the South. Next week on Sticky Fingers, Sticky Conversations, ice cream and ice raids. Control is a goddamn miracle. It lets women choose if and when to get pregnant, and that time is exactly when we want to steal the thunder from a friend's engagement announcement. <laughs> Birth control is incredibly useful. The problem is that it's so useful, it's being used as a treatment for a hell of a lot of things that aren't. Keep that baby out of me. Now, we all know that birth control is basic preventive care that women rely on for a whole host of reasons, not just pregnancy prevention, but also health conditions like endo endometriosis and fibroids and, and other uh, health conditions. Other health conditions like PCOS and dysmenorrhea and wanting to hit and quit Derek. <laughs> if a cis woman is having a problem between her belly button and her knees, birth control is often the only non-surgical treatment option she has. And for conditions like endometriosis, that really sucks. Actually, everything about endometriosis sucks. At times it feels like there's just a chainsaw going through you and like nonstop. And to the point where it goes in your back and in your legs, it's just nonstop pain. Aside from the intense pain, it also causes a host of other problems, including infertility and chronic fatigue. It also increases your risk of a heart attack by 52%, which is awful since we already have increased risk of heart attack from worrying that Jen secretly doesn't like us. Her <laughs> eye contact is always so short. You would think that a disease that is so painful it can actually stop your heart would at least be well understood, but doctors seem to have no fucking clue what endometriosis is. What okay. is endometriosis? Well, it is a disease. But it's a condition <laughs> where the cells that are normally inside the uterus occur outside the uterus. How do they get there? We don't know. It's like finding all of your furniture on your front lawn and the police are like, that's life. Want to take the pill? <laughs> one in 10 women suffer from endometriosis and it's just one of the many painful, debilitating lady diseases that gets treated with birth control and a shrug. There's also dysmenorrhea, irregular or excessive bleeding and polycystic ovary syndrome. PCOS afflicts one in 10 women with symptoms like weight gain, hair growth, fertility problems and diabetes. The only way that women could hate this this disease more is if it also gave you Trump's dick pic. <laughs> Since these diseases are incredibly common, poorly understood, and so painful, it's like your body's reenacting saw every month, you think there would be tons of medical research devoted to curing them, but you would be wrong. 10% of women have endometriosis, and it gets around $10 million of funding per year. 10% of people have diabetes, and it gets $1 billion of funding per year. I mean, to be fair, people have a better grasp on diabetes thanks to movies like Steel Magnolias and babysitters like Stacy. <laughs> Stacy, don't go into the candy shop. 
In the meantime, all you get is birth control. So if you have these diseases but want to get pregnant, you are shit out of luck. But the good news is we have literally dozens of medications to help men fuck good. Well, <laughs> good for them anyway. I mean, there's no pill to teach a dude to cut his fucking nails before he puts it. You know what? That's the subject <laughs> for another headline. Why aren't there better treatments for these intensely painful and common diseases? Um, <laughs> because they're happening to ladies. <laughs> Since the first caveman carved the first speculum out of cheetah bones, <laughs> misogyny has always gotten in the way of doctors figuring out what's going on with lady bits and hey, since it is Women's History Month, let's take a look back at the history of women's pain. Subtitle, Why You Have to Take Birth Control for Every Damn Lady Thing with American Treasure, Lori Metcalf. Doctor, I'm experiencing pain all over my body whenever I get my monthly visits from, you know, the goddess of war. Mm -hmm. That's because your uterus is a hungry animal, pac-manning around your body, searching for babies. Trust me, I'm the medical professional here. I know how to treat this. Okay, you're the doctor, I guess. Move, uterus! Dislodge and right thyself! Oh, you're very tight inside. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> By medieval times, things had actually gotten worse. People now believed that women with endometriosis were witches. Probably not a lot of women sought a diagnosis when the prescription was being burned at the stake. By the Victorian era, Medicine was truly advancing. General anesthesia was improved. We began to understand bacterial infection, and doctors even started wearing those head mirror things. But they still didn't understand women when they said, ouch. Doctor, I'm having this intense pain in my lady parts. Mm-hmm, well, there are two options. I can commit you to a lunatic asylum, or I can manually stimulate you to completion. Okay, I'll take the orgasm one. My sister, my sixth patient today, and my fingers are exhausted, so. Uh, here we go. Look, women are so yucky. That's right, Victorian doctors invented the first vibrators because they were tired of fingering their patients. I know we just showed you that, but I wanted to say it again because it's fucking amazing. <laughs> Once every 3,000 years or so, men's total ignorance of the female body works out in our favor. <laughs> Throughout the 20th century, endometriosis was considered a career woman's disease, and the pain still often thought to be all in a woman's head, and women's pain still isn't taken as seriously as it should be. It takes six to eight years, on average, to finally get diagnosed with endometriosis. Doctor, it's enough. I have been coming to you for years telling you that I am in pain and you have told me to lose weight. You've told me that I'm faking it. You've told me that an Advil would cover it and you've referred me to a therapist. It's 2018, there's no cure for endometriosis and yet you guys have developed like 45 different pills for boners and all you can offer me is the same old fucking birth control pill. So I'm done, I can't take it anymore. I could uh, burn you at the stake. I'll take the birth control. Very good. Should smile more. Got a pretty face. Now I know some of you were thinking, surely it's not that bad in 2018, but I know others of you are thinking, oh my God, how did you get a microphone into my gyno appointment from last week? <laughs> this stuff is not that far in the past. The medical community's indifference to women's bodies and opinions still affects all kinds of care. Up until 2010, Canada allowed medical students to practice pelvic exams on unconscious women without their consent who'd come in for gynecological surgery. So congrats if you woke up from surgery in Saskatchewan a few years ago with the eerie feeling that your crotch had taught a class. Don't worry, you're not crazy. You were assaulted by a doctor because nothing says let's make an entire country of women feel crazy more than unconsented to unconscious secret pelvic 
exams. And that is why we're still taking birth control for diseases that have gone unstudied for centuries. Because women's health care is still shrouded in the same fear, shame, and condescension that has been surrounding the female body since some dude made up a story about some lady stealing an apple to justify why he hates women. So ladies, next time you feel like the weight of the world is bearing down on your uterus, it is. I have a confession. Last night, I completely bailed on Alyssa Milano's sex strike. Shrek was on, I got very riled up. Ugh, the things I would do to that gingerbread man. <laughs> Clearly, the strike didn't work anyway. Today, Alabama effectively banned abortion from conception with no exceptions for rape and incest. Speaking of Alabama, no exceptions for rape and incest is also Roy Moore's dating profile. <laughs> Alabama's bill is the most far-reaching abortion ban this year, but it is not alone. Ohio Republicans are trying to ban insurance from covering almost all abortions, and six states have passed or are trying to pass so-called heartbeat bills. There have been more six-week abortion ban bills than Godfather movies, so I guess men really don't love anything more than policing women's bodies. <laughs> the one thing all these bills have in common is that the people writing them have no fucking idea how the internal reproductive system works. That's why I'm gonna do something that should have been done decades ago. I'm gonna teach sex ed to senators. <laughs> class, you fucking idiots. Time to learn about vaginas, cycles, and why Charlotte from Sex and the City was sad for two whole seasons. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with lesson one. We don't know we're pregnant the moment it happens. Eric Johnston, an attorney who helped draft the Alabama bill, thinks a man and woman can have sex and go straight to a clinic to determine if she's pregnant. First off, you gotta give her six minutes to clench her way to a toilet, otherwise she's gonna get a UTI and ruin an exam table. <laughs> Secondly, that isn't how it works. The most sensitive pregnancy test can't detect anything until eight or more days after fertilization, so if you're gonna be a psycho about it, wait 10 days and then buy her a bouquet of pea sticks like a gentleman. <laughs> It's still hard to know if you're pregnant at six weeks. You might have no symptoms, or if you do, there are symptoms like fatigue or bloating and gas. On the other hand, it does explain P.F. Chang's new motto, maybe it's not us, maybe you're pregnant. <laughs> Our next lesson goes out to Ohio rep John Becker, who hates logic as much as he hates women. This shaved ferret sponsored a bill that bans insurance from covering abortions, but allows insurance to cover a procedure that doesn't exist, reimplanting ectopic pregnancies. Part of that treatment would be removing the embryo from the uh, fallopian tube and then reinserting it in the uterus. So that's defined as not an abortion under this bill. Class is in session, dummies. You can't reimplant an ectopic pregnancy, you old tragic Kenneth from 30 Rock. <laughs> Becker's ignorance is going to kill people. Ectopic pregnancies are almost never viable. They are very dangerous and they can't be treated via close-up magic. An ectopic pregnancy happens outside the uterus, most likely in one of the fallopian tubes, but occasionally in other places, such as the ovary, abdominal cavity, or cervix. These bills aren't just legislating abortions. According to the Georgia law, if a woman has a miscarriage, she could be investigated to determine whether she received an abortion. What the people who wrote this law clearly don't understand is miscarriage is incredibly common. About 10 to 20 percent of known pregnancies end in miscarriage. Pregnancy loss can be devastating. Imagine if people were also forced to go through an unnecessary investigation. To put it in perspective for you male senators, it would be like if cops showed up every time you miracle whipped into your wife's good towels and accused you of genocide. Except different because you never wanted to bring your shame tadpoles to term. the lesson every single legislator should learn before writing abortion laws. What even is an abortion? Even politicians on the left don't seem to know the answer. Do you believe that a woman should be able to terminate a pregnancy up until the moment of birth? Look, I think that that happens very, very rarely. 
And I think this is being made into a political issue. Okay? So I think it's rare. It's being made into a political issue. It isn't rare. It is non-existent. You can't have an abortion at the moment of birth. Uncle Mothballs here isn't the only one getting it wrong. <laughs> Beto O'Rourke also whiffed, for one. You guys really, really need to get your facts straight, because when you don't, the right takes that ball and runs with it all the way to hell. The baby is born. The mother meets with the doctor. They take care of the baby. They wrap the baby beautifully. And then the doctor and the mother determine whether or not they will execute the baby. I don't think so. No, they don't. That would be homicide. Look. There are plenty of crazy positions on the left. For example, I believe the term manatee is too gendered. But no one is advocating for legalizing baby murder. Birth control and morning after pills also aren't abortions, but they're being regulated like they are anyway. In Ohio, meanwhile, Republicans are proposing a bill to prohibit private insurance companies from covering abortions, but could also limit access to birth control. When you get into contraceptives and abortifacients, that's, you know, clearly not my area of expertise, but I suppose if it were true that, you know, what we typically know as the, as the pill would be classified as an abortifacient, then I, I would I would imagine the uh, drug manufacturers would reformulate it so it's no longer an abortifacient and strictly a contraceptive. Here's what John Becker should have said. That's, you know, clearly not my area of expertise. Stop there! Stop right there! Birth control pills contain hormones that prevent a person from ovulating. The morning after pill works similarly and can also prevent fertilization and implantation. Neither of them cause abortions. Banning them sure does, though. Look, I have to wrap up because I gotta go teach gym for senators. Look. <laughs> These laws are designed to oppress and control and ultimately overturn Roe v. Wade. And if they succeed, they will directly result in death and poverty for women and other vulnerable people. But it is especially fucked up that the people doing the regulating wouldn't recognize a vulva if it bit them in the face. Oh, <laughs> yes, I forgot to tell you this one thing. They all bite. After their orgy of mutual loathing, Clinton and Trump flew back to New York for the Al Smith Dinner, an annual Catholic charity event named for the pseudonym that Bill Clinton uses when he checks into hotels. <laughs> the event forced them almost as close together as Maria Bartiromo's show-stealing tatas. Was it awkward? <laughs> no, not at all. Hillary is so corrupt. She got kicked off. The Watergate Commission. Here she is tonight, in public, <laughs> pretending not to hate Catholics. <laughs> Trump shocked a Catholic cardinal, and cardinals have seen some pretty sick shit. <laughs> The dinner affirmed what we always knew, that the church is a powerful peacemaker, and that every man in New York got to host a comedy show before I did. But comedy's not the only sideline Holy Mother Church has a stake in. Lately, their big growth area has been hospital mergers. Catholic hospitals have become the largest nonprofit health care provider in the U.S. with over 600 hospitals. This year, one in six patients will be cared for at a Catholic hospital. It's all detailed in Dan Brown's new thriller, Angels and Bedpans. <laughs> Catholic hospitals provide excellent care until the moment your medical needs conflict with their dogma. So if a hospital is bought by a Catholic facility, it then has to adhere to the religious directives of the Catholic facility. Physicians can no longer do abortions, even when the mother's life is in danger, and they can no longer perform sterilizations or provide contraception. Plus, you can bet they'll put an end to all that filthy deathbed masturbating. The ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services is a slim volume of 72 medical commandments that fit neatly between a patient and her doctor. It was written by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, a group so conservative they make Jerry Falwell look like Jerry Garcia, which means that decisions affecting millions of American vaginas are being made by people who have never owned one or touched one. 
Here's what one of those bishops did when a Catholic hospital in Arizona terminated a pregnancy to save the mother's life. It was not an either-or case. Your decision is, do you let both die or do you terminate the pregnancy so the mother can live? And um, to me, that's a no-brainer. Bishop Olmsted stripped St. Joseph's of its 116-year-long Catholic affiliation, and Sister Margaret McBride, the nun who had approved the abortion, was excommunicated. Father Fancy Hat threw a nun out of heaven for saving a life? What was Sister McBride supposed to do, medically and ethically speaking? Father John Eric is the medical ethics director for the Diocese of Phoenix. There are some situations where the mother may in fact die along with her child. Right. Those situations are called the Middle Ages. <laughs> Sister McBride and the church eventually reconciled. I'm sure the makeup sex was great, but the clergy's let's go guide to Eve's perdition hole is pretty troubling. It doesn't even allow termination of an extra uterine pregnancy. As anyone with a womb knows, an ectopic pregnancy has almost zero chance of surviving. It's in the wrong place, much like a uterus is the wrong place for a priest. I wasn't allowed to offer tubal ligations. I wasn't allowed to offer contraception. And this is including women that had high-risk medical conditions where they should not be getting pregnant again. Like Jennifer, who was desperate to avoid a fourth pregnancy after her third nearly killed her. I asked if, at the time of the C-section, if I could have a tubal ligation. So my doctor was very sympathetic and understanding and wished that she was able to perform it, but she couldn't based upon the hospital's medical directives. The only thing the hospital did was told us that we could call a 1-800 number and make a complaint. Can we try that 800 number? <laughs> oh, thank you for calling Vatican Complaints. If you have suffered brain damage and a kidney failure from a preventable uterine infection, press a 1. Come on, I pressed two for Latin. And by the way, that actually happened to a woman outside Chicago. Why do I sense the clergy are a bit cavalier about female suffering? The fact that they can't get, receive sterilizations or abortions at a Catholic health care facility is not a form of suffering at all. As a matter of fact, that we're protecting them from evil things that could happen to them. Yeah, thanks, Friar Suck. When I need reproductive advice from a virgin in a bathrobe, I'll let you know. I mean, sure, you can try to avoid hospitals that force doctors to get a second opinion from one of the medieval times busboys in charge of women's health, but when you're in the throes of a miscarriage, it's hard to grab the wheel of the ambulance and drive to Beth Israel. Besides, you might run out of gas before you got there. There are several areas in this country where the only accessible hospital is a Catholic facility. Catholic hospitals are kind of like the Waffle House of medical care. If Waffle House got $115 billion a year in federal funds. Luckily, Mindy lived in an area with more than one hospital when her pregnancy went horribly wrong. My son had lethal birth defects and my water broke, which meant that he was not going to live and it put me at risk for getting an infection losing my uterus and the worst case scenario, death. The Catholic hospital we went to for treatment couldn't treat us because they were Catholic, so they sent us to a public hospital who couldn't treat us because the Catholic hospital didn't send them records. I'll give this to the church. They're great at keeping secrets. Catholic red tape kept Mindy from doing the only thing a mother wants to do, protect her child. They just put their rules and their ideology above my baby's pain and suffering. I knew my baby. I was the person, the only person in the world looking out for his best interest. I try not to think about the pain that he could have felt. He wouldn't have felt anything if they would have just terminated the pregnancy when my water broke. It took so much out of me mentally, you know, because all I wanted to do was just sit and cry for the baby that I, I was going to lose, but I hadn't lost yet. It was just terrible. I, I, there are no words to describe how awful it was. I don't have a joke here. Hey, comedy cardinal, can you help me out? No? In that case, I'd like a word with the priesthood. How can our suffering and danger mean so little to you? Modern obstetric medicine is a miracle. It's the reason women in developed countries don't have to choose between having children and staying alive. A miscarriage is already the worst day of a woman's life. And in a Catholic healthcare network, it could also be her last. And maybe that's okay with you, but do you really wanna spend eternity explaining yourself to her? 
Aw, thanks for watching. If you'd like to hear more from Full Frontal, hit subscribe and visit our page for more videos. Or if you'd like to be radicalized, leave YouTube on autoplay.